Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Jeffrey Epstein Show. I'm your host, Bobby Capucci, and this is a morning update. Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome to the program. We're going to dispense with the monologue this morning, and we're just going to, we're going to jump right in. It's basically a continuation of our conversation from yesterday morning when we were talking about Jeffrey Epstein and the Gratz hustle. Now, we know that Jeffrey Epstein had all kinds of different ways to avoid paying taxes and to launder money and to make sure that the government had no idea what his assets truly were. We know all of this, and we know he was good at that, right? The guy is an epic scumbag, one of the most evil people I've ever read about, but the dude knew the money hustle. There is zero doubt about that. And not only did Jeffrey Epstein know the hustle, he helped out some of his rich friends with this knowledge. So my question today, like it always is, is how much did Leon Black know, and when did he know it? There is zero chance that Leon Black and Jeffrey Epstein didn't know intimately what they were doing with $158 million being sent around, all right? Jeffrey Epstein and Leon Black were very, very close. And from all of the circumstantial evidence that we have presented to us, it's rather obvious that Jeffrey Epstein, at the very least, was helping Leon Black Avoid paying taxes. So, when's Leon Black getting arrested for, by the IRS? When's the IRS showing up at his house f- with a raid and 50 uh, FBI agents in tow? Hey, if it's good enough for Martha Stewart, it should be good enough for Leon Black. Considering Leon Black can cause a lot more damage to the market than someone like Martha Stewart, Stewart ever could have. Now, Leon Black is a kingmaker, folks. This is... When we talk about hedgies here on this podcast and people who are absolutely disgusting, Leon Black is the epitome of all of that, in my opinion. The dude is so mega wealthy and so mega rich, and yet he is still trying to avoid paying taxes on little crumbs. It just shows you the disregard that they have for the rest of us. It shows you the disregard that they have for the quote-unquote laws that are on the books. Now, as far as those laws go, I I really can't blame them for, for not respecting them. There's no teeth in those laws, right? Nobody goes to jail. Nobody goes to prison. Refresh my memory. How many people from the banks went to prison after the financial meltdown? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Anyone? That's right. Nobody went to prison for for that nonsense, okay? But your pensions, your futures destroyed. How many of you were younger back then and saw your parents sitting around the table counting change to try and make ends meet? Thankfully, entertainment wasn't hit that hard by that. So I didn't, you know, I didn't really see my my parents struggle the way I'm seeing, you know, things, you know, break left for people in entertainment through this pandemic. But the point is, these banksters and these hedgies have never ever 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 had to pay the price for the destruction that they have caused and that they are still causing. These people have no regard for anything or anybody. They care about two things, power and the consolidation of that power. That is it. Our article today is from the Harvard Crimson, and the author is Guillermo S. Hava. Headline, Tax Avoidance 101 with Leon Black and Jeffrey Epstein. Now, I think it's a uh, solid move that Harvard is covering this the way they are, right? The Crimson has been pretty decent throughout this. They've covered the Leon Black stuff, the stuff with uh, Harvard, right? The the Jeffrey Epstein stuff with Harvard. So the, the Crimson here is doing a decent job covering it. And I can only imagine the minefield that they have to navigate to get this story out. I mean, we're dealing with some of the most powerful people in academia, never mind just uh, uh, Harvard, right? So reporting on them for someone like this can't be comfortable. 
So props to Guillermo for getting that story out there. At first glance, Leon D. Black seems like the ideal university donor. A poster boy for billionaire philanthropy. In 1990, he co-founded Apollo Global Management, a now colossal private equity firm. Black's subsequent fortune allowed him to become a productive, charitable member of elite, so-called elite, society. A patron of the arts, both as Museum of Modern Art chairman and as a private collector best known for purchasing one of the four original versions of the Scream for just under $120 million dollars at a Southby's auction. So, right off the bat, we get the profile of someone who is extremely wealthy. I mean, extremely wealthy, right? A $120 million painting from Southby's? Really? The Scream? And I find that ironic as well because you know what that that painting looks like, right? It's pretty iconic, the screen painting. I'm sure that's what Leon Black's face looked like when he got those subpoenas and he found out that he was in hot water here, that he wasn't uh, going to avoid being caught up in this entanglement. I'm sure his face mimicked what that picture looks like in the screen. Now, the fact that he's still the chairman at MoMA is a travesty. MoMA should be better, they should do better, and they should demand that Leon Black steps down, and if he doesn't step down, they should remove him as a board and as a group, because folks, it is not a good look. Not a good look at all. And it just goes again to show you that the the art world, the world of academia, the world of modeling, all of these people... The whole entire structure seems to be rotten at its core of all of those industries. And they're going to have a reckoning at some point. And I think that reckoning is right down the pipe. A successful alumnus of the Harvard Business School, Black has also become a prominent supporter of our university and its intellectual mission. He and his family foundation have pledged almost $20 million to Harvard and its various schools, including a $7.5 million contribution to create student fellowships for U.S. military members at the Kennedy School of Government, where he, coincidentally enough, also serves as a member of the Leadership Council. Now think about that for a minute, okay? Leon Black's bitch ass is a member of the council of the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Now, where do you think all of these politicians that you love and cheer for are going to school? You don't think people like Leon Black have their ear right away? You don't think big lobbyists like Leon Black are in a fantastic position when they're members of boards such as these, when the movers and shakers of tomorrow are within their hands now to mold? Come on, folks. This is all a hustle. It is all a scam. And people like Leon Black put themselves in these positions so that they can mold the future leaders of tomorrow. And that's why I say all the time, we got to change the game. Let's shake it up. You don't need to go to Harvard to be a politician. You don't need to go to Yale to be a politician. You need to have some goddamn common sense. That's what you need to have. And guess what? A moral compass that is not broke. How about we get some politicians that make the pledge? I will go to Congress and I will serve one term as a congressman or congresswoman. And then if I, after that term is over, I will try, if I want to keep going, I will serve one term as a senator. And then if that wants to, if you, once that's done and you want to go back to your home state and, and be a, a politician there, fine. But on the federal level, every one of these politicians should commit to one or two terms at the most. Besides that, What we have is a bureaucracy filled with Harvard-trained scumbags who are corrupted from the very beginning by people like Leon Black. Yet his munch-buying luck has been down as of late. In October, a New York Times expose revealed extensive ties between Black and another New York financier, pedophile, convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. Back in 2019... Black had dismissed the allegations of criminal Epstein connections and the tsunami of coverage as the gift that never stops giving. It's salacious. It involves elements of politics, of Me Too, of rich and powerful people. 
All right, uh, translation, woe is me. Woe is me, there's nothing here. All this is is because we're rich and we're powerful. This is just salacious, salacious. It's the gift that never stops giving. Yeah, well, guess what? If you didn't help refurbish your buddy Jeffrey Epstein's um, image and you didn't help him financially, then maybe it wouldn't be the gift that continued to give. Guess who it wasn't a gift for, though? Leon Black. The survivors, you bitch-ass punk. But the tsunami led to reckoning, as they usually do. An internal review commissioned by Apollo emphasized that there was no evidence that Black had been involved in any criminal activity, but revealed that he had paid Epstein almost $160 million over five years for advice on a variety of tax and philanthropy issues. It was damning enough to cost Black his job as chief executive officer of his own firm. Uh, yeah, no shit. It should be damning enough to have anybody who is associated with him running for the hills. There is no explanation that you or anyone on this planet can give me that I will accept about Leon Black's relationship with Jeffrey Epstein. It's not purely business, okay? And if it is, what sort of criminal activity is Jeffrey Epstein engaging or was engaging in to try and help Leon Black hide this money? You don't pay $158 million for advice on charitable giving. Not when you're surrounded by so many rich and powerful and smart people like Leon Black was. You mean to tell me all those people at Apollo weren't hip? They couldn't have given him good advice? He had to go off the reservation and go get this Yahoo? Stop it. Who's believing that? Now the contents and the character of the review conducted by Wall Street law firm Deckert LLP could fill up an entire column, if not a series. There's, for example, the fact that the chairman of the supposedly independent committee overseeing the probe had eyebrow-raising ties to Apollo itself only five years ago. Remember when I, talk, when I was talking about this, about how there's no such thing as these companies not being connected, these law firms not being connected to people on Wall Street? Deckard's in the bag, bro, for Leon Black. Leon Black is so powerful. I don't, you know, I, if you don't understand how the financial game works and how the financial sector works, then you don't understand the true power of somebody like Leon Black and why it's so extraordinary that we're tanning his hide like this. We don't get chances to, to, to nail people like this very often, folks. Not very often at all. And Deckert is very hip to the fact that Leon Black is very powerful. So when they're doing this investigation, they're treading lightly because, well, they're hedging their bets. They don't want to take the chance of voting Leon Black into the challenge, to use an MTV analogy, and having him come back, right? So they're hedging their bets. The skepticism of several industry, uh, industry insiders about the, vera the veracity of the report, or even Deckard's own admission that it was aided in its probe by a former Apollo outside legal counselor, Paul Weiss, who had helped vet Epstein's advice to Black in the past. Whatever happened to conflicts of interest? Yeah, I agree there, Guillermo. What the hell ever happened to that, huh? Don't you think that's a little bit fishy that they would go and use Paul Weiss, who used to be outside legal counselor for Apollo to help them conduct this investigation. I mean, here's an idea. You really want to be independent? Farm that shit out to somebody out of town that you have no idea who they are and they have no connections to you or your company. Besides that, this is all song and dance and theater. Guess what? We see right through it. Black's connections to Epstein, particularly as they relate to our university, where several professors enjoyed an unexpected windfall as a result of an Epstein-mediated introduction with Black, are hardly a settled matter. That's damn sure the case. And again, that is why I had Dr. Stephen DeLay on here to talk about things from an insider's perspective within the structure of academia. And we're not talking about at a community college. We're talking about Oxford, folks, okay? An elite university filled with people just like this, the movers and shakers of tomorrow. But yet, there is still 
a shroud of secrecy, still a curtain that needs to be pulled back further so that we can examine the contents of the room in the light. Because a reckoning is coming for academia. Mark my words. But let's, for a change, assume the best. We know at this point that that's how our own institution is dealing with such allegations. Assume that Black really had no unseemly ties to Epstein, that their relationship was based entirely on professional convenience and financial advantage. All right, I'm, I'm trying to look at it in that light, but boy, it's hard with everything we know, right? It's hard to suspend all of the information that we have compiled. Let's look beyond the ties themselves and zero into their presumed origin. We might find a less salacious but more meaningful tale, a story of wealthy philanthropists and the broken tax code that makes them. Well, that's definitely part of this for me, and it doesn't make him any less complicit, right? If he was using Epstein, a known sex trafficker, a known human trafficker, to try and skim money from the government and from society itself, boy, oh boy, that is just as big of a problem. And he should be going to prison for that as well. According to the Deckert Report, Epstein offered his most valuable piece of work to Black in 2012, paving the way for the sex offender to gain substantial monetary and personal access to one of New York's finance's most powerful people. And there's zero doubt about that. Leon Black, I know I said this a little bit ago, but he is uh, your, your prototypical uh, uh, kingmaker. He is the guy that makes big decisions. You know, I talk about uh, Bobby Axelrod from the show Billions, and that's the kind of guy Leon Black is, right? Not as cool, certainly not as cool, certainly not as hip, and definitely not as much of a break your face kind of dude, but the same kind of try and destroy everybody around me to consolidate my power type of guy. Zero doubt about that. And Leon Black has made a career out of enriching himself on the back of struggling and failing companies. He is a financial predator, folks, point blank, period. The work itself was some financial advice related to how best manage Black's grantor retained annuity trust, or GRAT for short. Epstein's advice reportedly saved Black as much as $1 billion or more in tax liabilities. And again, as much as I hate Jeffrey Epstein and Leon Black and the whole entire way this this scam system is set up, we have to go to the source of the problem. And the source of the problem is in Washington, D.C. with the people we elect. Remember I just talked about all those people, the movers and shakers of tomorrow who are on the Harvard board, who go to Harvard and they're, they're dealing with people like Leon Black on a regular basis before they get into politics, you know, when they're being molded? Yeah, well... Here's the problem rearing its ugly head, right? Why would those people being molded by people like Leon Black when they're in school and younger at these so-called high-profile institutions? Why would they write laws when they become lawmakers that would screw their mentors and their bagmen? Well, they wouldn't, okay? Because it's a parasitic relationship. Black's astronomical savings, almost enough to, for example, quadruple federal funding for historically black colleges and universities. Let that sit in for let that let that soak for a minute, okay? His savings were enough to fund the historically black colleges and universities. That's the kind of tax game this son of a bitch was playing. That's the sort of scam he was running on the American people. And once again, look who suffers. Imagine if he would have to pay taxes on that. It would account for roughly one-eighth of Black's current estimated net worth. It embodies the kind of perfectly legal, deeply impactful tax avoidance that's popular among the ultra-wealthy, including a certain former president, and that deepens economic inequality and mistrust in the fairness of our institutions. Oh, what? We're going we're gonna to act like Trump's the only one playing this game? I wonder how much the Clinton Foundation has buried offshore. I wonder how much all these ex-presidents, I wonder how much George Bush has buried offshore. Give me a break. They're all corrupt, folks, okay? 
Guess what? I know this is going to shake a lot of people at their core. I know a lot of people don't want to hear this, all right? Everybody wants to think that their person is the good guy in this story. Breaking news. None of these politicians are the good guy. They're all gray characters at best. So what are Gratz anyway? I exchanged emails with Harvard Law Professor Robert H. Sitkoff to get a better understanding of how the technique, popularized by Harvard graduate Richard Covey of Class of 1950, actually works. Do you see what I'm talking about with Harvard, folks? Every time you turn around, it's someone who went to Harvard that's screwing the rest of us. I have had my fill of Harvard University. Sitkoff described Gratz as a normal and customary estate planning tool to minimize transfer taxes, and agreed that minimizing tax liabilities, namely transfer taxation, was their primary purpose. L- let me translate. Just another tool for the rich to use to keep their money while you and I are just struggling to make our rent, to make sure we're not in default, to make our car payments. These guys, on the other hand, now we'll just move a little money around. We'll shove some money here, shove some money there, pay some fees on it, and then act like we're doing real business. Meanwhile, it's all a scam. Meanwhile, these dudes are more corrupt than John Gotti and the Gambinos could have ever been. A grat is an irrevocable trust to which the donor conveys property, and that provides for a term of annuity payments from the trust to the donor, Sitkoff explained. To oversimplify a complex evasion mechanism from which few readers are likely to benefit, an individual can create a trust and receive payments from it for a given amount of time, after which the remaining contents of the trust go to the assigned beneficiary. Sounds good so far, right? Especially if you're involved in the scam, which I know most of us certainly aren't. Such gifts would usually be taxed under the aptly named gift tax, but under a GRAT, the fiscal liability becomes more mm, complicated. The gift tax is applied upon the creation of the GRAT, but is calculated under the erroneous assumption that the property within it will increase in value at the now historically low, federally established rate, even if it turns out to do so at a substantially higher pace and is not applied to the sum of the annuity payments taken out of the trust. Let me put that into layman's terms. We're all getting hosed, okay? These people are able to use the historically low rate that was current at the time when this law was passed now for their hustle, as I, as I like to call it, the grad hustle. You and I aren't able to do that. And that's how it's all set up. You know, I talk about the two-tiered justice system. There certainly is a multi-tiered financial system as well. Combine that underestimated future value with exempt annuity payments, and you have what, on paper, seems like a small or inexistent gift, liable to little taxation even as you transfer substantial wealth to a second party. So again, goes back to the government officials, the law. You mean to tell me that we can't update this law, a law that's been on the books since like the 60s or some wild shit? Come on, guys. Give me a break. They don't update it because they don't want to update it. Now, though, guess what? I don't want to hear nothing, okay? The Democrats own all three chambers. It's put up or shut up time, all right? Because the days of bullshitting us and saying you're going to get things done and then not doing it, those days are over because we're watching now. We're paying attention. So black, So back to black. A Harvard graduate pioneers a complex system to avoid millions in taxation. A New York billionaire uses the same technique on advice from Epstein and invests a a fraction of his newly engorged wealth donating to Epstein-linked professors and setting up a fellowship program named after himself. Nothing to see here, folks. There's nothing untowards going on here. This isn't a hustle. This isn't an an absolute scam. Epstein isn't spraying some money around the campuses with other purposes in mind. Society is cheated out of hundreds of millions in revenue, the kind of funds that could go a very long way towards setting up universal preschool federally. And Harvard gets a permanent tie to a now-tainted mogul.
You know, this is real money. I talk about it all the time. Everyone says, oh, we don't have the money to do this. We don't have the money to do that. Oh, we have the money, folks. All right. We have the money. We don't spend it correctly and we don't appropriate it properly. How much money has been spent on the needless war in Iraq and Afghanistan? Trillions. Now, think about if we would have put those trillions, all of them, into the infrastructure of this country. Think about how much better everybody's lives would be. They don't want that. If your life is better, well, they, you don't need them then. You don't need the government to come in and save you. You don't need the government to provide everything for you because society is functioning correctly. So that takes their power away, their power over you away, and they can't have it. Harvard's desire for donations is more than understandable. It is the base of our exceptional financial aid program, arguably one of the reasons why Harvard, unlike other schools, can offer need-blind admissions even to international applicants. We all love the generous fellowships and excellent infrastructure that tax-avoiding pseudo-philanthropists have provided us. Well, here's an idea. How about we just, you know, make tuition affordable? There's a really good idea. This this whole industry of paying hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to go to Harvard to be taught by these scumbags, I, I just don't I don't see bang for your buck there. I certainly wouldn't be sending my kid to Harvard, that's for sure. But our institution and its counterparts are trapped in a gold-plated version of the prisoner's dilemma. Harvard, along with MoMA, and other black finance enterprises could benefit from the increased levels of federal funding afforded by equitable, grip-free taxation. More crucially, they have, or perhaps should have, a duty as society-minded institutions to protect the public's well-being against the excesses of exorbitant inequality. Yes, for sure. And, you know, people throw that word around a lot, right? Inequality this and inequality that. What we're talking about here is all of that quantified to such a level that it'll make your head spin. The people we're dealing with here have more money and more power than anyone you could possibly imagine. And that is not hyperbole. Because we are all competing for the very same handful of billionaire donors, we also have an incentive to simply follow the money. To create, to create pretentiously named leadership councils that reward financial support and offer donation options that emphasize tax breaks and financial rewards. This twisted game theory dilemma might explain why our university split with Epstein was half-hearted at best and why it doesn't seem to be seriously re-examining its ties to black amidst broad backlash, even after he subverted the spirit of our gift policy by by facilitating funds to Epstein protégés after his conviction. A spokesperson for the Kennedy School of Government didn't immediately reply to a request for comment for this article. And again, it's chilling. I don't know how much more I can focus on the fact that the Kennedy School of Government is one of the biggest breeding grounds for the leaders of tomorrow. And they're being corrupted right from the jump. They're being corrupted by these people, these Epstein types. Do you really think that Jeffrey Epstein didn't know what he was doing? Do you think that he was just donating money randomly? There is a method and a madness to everything Epstein did. And that is one thing we have certainly proven throughout this whole entire escapade. But as in the prisoner's dilemma, the incentive to reject donations on the grounds of unmet tax responsibilities is low. If Black doesn't donate to our school, he can simply take his money elsewhere. There isn't exactly a shortage of institutions eager to accept seven-figure contributions. So we find ourselves in an ethically gray no-man's land, unable or unwilling to forcefully oppose the undermine the undermining of the social goals that we value, perpetually pursuing the ultra-wealthy so they can redirect their fortune to our own community. We become the silent beneficiaries of an unfair elite before we have even groomed its next generation. And Harvard remains intimately intertwined with Gratz, Griffs, and Leon Black. Folks, it's great to see that Guillermo Hava, the associate editorial editor 
of the Harvard Crimson is talking about Gratz because this isn't something people are talking about in this case. Everybody wants the more salacious details. Nobody wants to get down and grind numbers. Well, guess what? I have my number counting hat on and I'm here to grind the numbers. I'm here to dig in to Jeffrey Epstein's financial ties and we're going to keep on going and we're going to keep on digging until all of this makes sense. If you'd like to contact me, you can do that at bobbycapucci at protonmail.com. That's B-O-B-B-Y-C-A-P-U-C-C-I at protonmail.com. You can also find me on Twitter at B-O-B-B-Y underscore C-A-P-U-C-C-I. All of the links that go with this episode can be found in the description box. All right, folks, I will be back later on, and we will pick up where we left off.